name is Norm Bolsky, your host, and this is the Digital Health Heavyweights Podcast. Thanks, Norm. It's an uh, honor to be here, and it's been fun to work with you over the years. Welcome to the Digital Health Heavyweights Podcast with your host, Norm Volsky. And today we are thrilled to be joined by Brandon Feeney. Brandon is a partner at Providence Ventures. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you. So for all of our listeners and viewers that aren't uh, super familiar with Providence Ventures, uh, they focus on venture and growth stage digital health companies, making notable investments in Ortholine, MacroHealth, Arrive Health, no two. Um, Brandon actively sits on the boards of Macro Health, Ready Set Food, Arrive, Omada, Dexcare, and No2. Brandon previously gained experience at Transformation Capital, a Boston-based growth equity firm, and at Strathsby Crown in Newport Beach, engaging across a wide spectrum of healthcare investments. Brandon holds an MBA from the Wharton School at UPenn and a mathematics degree from Northwestern University, um, where he was a distinguished Ryan Scholar. Brandon, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. Wanted to start off by asking, you know, how you kind of found your niche and your groove at the intersection between healthcare and finance. Yeah, it's funny. Healthcare was really a mechanism to get into finance. I was never a finance first person. I come from a healthcare mm -hmm. family. And healthcare as an industry inspired me because it has like the best of many worlds. On one hand, it's very technically demanding. So it's very stimulating work. But on the other hand, you're not alone in a room all day. You know, you're working with people and impacting patients' lives. And mm -hmm. you're, working in, you're, you're working in and around technologies and people that have global and timeless relevance because people will always need healthcare one way or another. Um, and so over time, as I exposed myself to traditional healthcare settings as a pre-med, I was a pre-med student, you know, studying chemistry uh -huh. and math and all that, I started to get really familiar with really all the, the, many of the pain points that healthcare is experiencing and that, you know, to, to transform this industry, you're going to need more than caregivers. You're going to need more than clinical technologies. There are a lot of different ways you can attack healthcare to improve it. And when I came across venture capital as a way to build companies and, and introduce new categories to transform the industry in, in a way that could impact millions, I saw venture capital as, as a really interesting way to innovate um, as opposed to maybe, you know, being a clinician. So that, that's what I chose and uh, also fits my personality. It's really fun. I love it. You're obviously great at it. Walk me through at what point you kind of decided like, hey, I'm not going to go the clinical route. I'm going to go to the VC route. And like, how did that even come about? How did you even know that opportunity and that pathway existed? Yeah, so so um, luck was involved. I mean, it was a combination of luck and, and you know, there, there was definitely hard work involved. But, but really what happened was when I was in college, you'd go to Northwestern, I was a pre-med student doing all that stuff, going through all those classes, doing research, just like, you know, on the medical school route. Mm -hmm. And um I crossed paths. I'll leave it at that. I, I, I luckily crossed paths with one of the investors at Sandbox Industries in okay. Chicago. So it's one of the earlier digital health uh, venture funds. I started lamenting the fact of what physicians were going through and what patients were going through in healthcare, mm -hmm. as I had been exposed to it for several years at that point. And um, they, they offered me an internship there while I was a college student. And so I started to get exposed to the world of the, biz the business of healthcare, the finance of healthcare and investing generally, because I had been so science and kind of clinically focused at that point. Mm -hmm. And that experience there uh, is what opened my eyes. It opened my eyes to what you could do if you made the right decisions and partnered with the right people mm -hmm. and how you could make an impact on, you know, thousands or even millions of people's lives as, as an innovator, you know, vers versus a clinician and combining that realization and come to Jesus moment to myself yeah. combined with personally, it was very appealing. I, I, I loved the work and I loved the, the socializing of it, the network building of it. That's when I decided I was a, a junior in college when I decided, okay, I'll, I'll finish out the pre-med program just in case, 
but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm likely not going to go to med school. So, so I, I went into to private equity out of college and have yeah. been doing investing since. Getting your MBA at Wharton definitely doesn't hurt if you want to go the finance route. So you definitely, uh, you know, changed paths and entered the right one. And I'm sure a lot of thought went into that. I'm just curious, being pre-med, having four years of that experience at Northwestern, how does that make you a better investor today, especially in this space? I'd like to think two things. One, I've, I've worked and I know a lot of physicians. So I feel mm -hmm. like even though I never went to med school, I have some level of empathy and relatability to arguably some of the most important stakeholders in healthcare. You know, these caregivers yeah. are actually providing care to patients. Um, I, I can speak at least some of their language dangerously. So they, mm -hmm. so I, they, they can, they know that I know some, not just a finance guy sitting on an ivory tower. So that's, that's one way. The okay. other way is I think how I approach invest. I think of myself as a, as a scientist, not necessarily a business person, which comes with its own challenges. But mm -hmm. I, I think my brain, because of all that, all of that training that, that you referenced norm is, um, I demand a certain level of understanding for things to make sense. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm, I'm careful with decisions I make from the investment standpoint. I'm not loosey goosey with the way I go about things. So I hope that's an advantage. That's great. No, I'm sure in pre-med you get taught they like cross every T dot every I, dot every I, it could save someone's life. I think investing probably takes the same level of scrutiny to have outsized returns. So it makes a lot of sense how that was uh, a helpful learning, you know, in your growth. Um, so you left the internship at Sandbox, then you graduated and joined Strathsby Crown Holdings. Uh, can you walk me through how you found that opportunity and how that shaped your career in digital health? Yeah, finding that opportunity was also, I think, a little more hustle than Sandbox. I remember at that point, I had decided, you know, I want to I want to go invest and, and find new technologies in healthcare. So I started you know, scouring my network and the universe for, for opportunities within more, I think I had a more clinically oriented bent at that, at that point, you know, yep. this is like my pre-digital health days. Um, and so I, I, I came across at that point, a new fund that was launching in Newport beach that was doing something interesting. And this kind of gets into how it shaped my view of healthcare and digital health more broadly, but Strathsby crown, like for quick context, um, we invest in business and technologies that were more in the life sciences segment. So like pharma yeah. and biotech and medtech. And what was interesting about what they were doing at the time was most of our capital came from physicians. Mm -hmm. So we had, we had over a thousand physicians, um, all specialists that were LPs in the fund. Yeah. So I, I got even more intimate exposure into, like I said, I think one of the most important stakeholders in healthcare and mm -hmm. learn their challenges and desires and perspectives firsthand. And I, you know, I learned that American healthcare was upside down in that, in that job. I mean, we used to, at Strasby Crown, we, we, we would half, half joke. There are four P's in healthcare, patients, providers, a payers, and then products like, you know, mm -hmm. pharma, biotech, and devices and all that. And historically, patients were at the top, um, providers were second, and then products and then payers. And over time, I won't tell you where I think those P's are now, yeah. but patients are not at the top. And, sadly, no. And sadly, no. And, and, so, and so what I, you know, kind of what shaped my view there, just getting to know these physicians and, you know, their perspective, which is naturally biased, of course, you know, mm -hmm. they're just, they're a certain stakeholder group and they're different from others, um, is that, you know, to make healthcare, uh, to fix it, or at least, you know, may, maybe make it sustainable, you'll need more than clinical technologies. You'll need combination of regulatory change, organizational innovation, and of course, digital innovation. And when you think of digital health, it's not just information technology and analytics, like it, it actually advances all three of those things in a mm -hmm. way. So that was my, that was my foundation. I'm, I'm going to add a fifth P. Sadly, I think this P is, you know, unfortunately on top over all the others. I think profits are sadly the most important thing right now. Um, yeah. and patients are not, you know, above that, unfortunately. So I think there's a lot of companies trying to help uh, change that ranking. That's fair. Um, so walk me through some of your main accomplishments and you know, what were you most proud of, of your time over at uh, Strasby? Mm -hmm. I think, well, I, I think the most straightforward ones, I mean, as an investor, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that I was 
my deal team enjoyed, you know, a couple of successfully exited companies. So, yep. you know, one of, one of those was, was an IPO of a, of a pharmaceutical product, uh, well, biopharmaceutical specifically that we had acquired before clinical trials had begun. Um, it was a, a neurotoxin uh, product that was a really risky bet that that paid mm -hmm. off. So I'm proud of that stuff. But I, I think more generally, and this kind of ties back to my foundation as a contributor in healthcare, is I'm, I'm proud of the relationships I developed with with all those physicians who just wanted to practice medicine and, and do right by the patient. Their, you know, their, their life's work and experience has shaped my view and hope for, for the future of healthcare. I love that. As someone who observes or sits on, you know, a handful of boards, you know, there are a lot of healthcare companies, um, you know, that need help, including, you know, the groups that you sit on, uh, Macro Health, Omada, Arrive. Can you share any behind the scenes glimpse of strategic discussions that you and your board had that shaped the trajectory and strategy of the company? So all, this is the common thread across all companies we're involved with, but, but with the ones you mentioned specifically, the common thread was the, was the breadth of their potential impact. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they were affecting a lot of stakeholders. You know, like when you look at Omada, it's this, broadly speaking, a disease management platform that, that attacks diabetes, hypertension, behavioral health conditions, musculoskeletal conditions. And so it's this really broad, clinically broad platform. Yep. But then, and so you think of, okay, so it affects a lot of patients. Well, no, because then there's the, the customers too. There's, there's the self-insured employers, there's the payers, there are the brokers that are helping the employers choose their benefits for their employees. And then there's of course- PBMs reselling it. Yeah, yeah, there's PBMs reselling it or recommending it. It's on their formulary. And then of course there's the clinicians um, that fit within the care team that Omada is trying to be a part of. And so there's, there's all these stakeholders involved and, you know, Omada is just, just one of many examples. And so there was never just in these conversations when you could have this, this world-class product that is ticking off all these boxes, like, okay, clinically evidence-based product check. Mm -hmm. It's, it's differentiated check. It's defensible. Like we have a defensible moat check. It's delivering value. But all those can work out, but you still have to ask the question, like, how do you sell it? Mm -hmm. how, how, do you, how do you maximize adoption? Who's a buy-in do you need? Where does the money come from and who's using it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, the answers to all those questions could all be different people, all different stakeholders. And so, you know, from the beginning and this, you know, as the company expands, this question remains, it's what is the go-to-market motion? And it's not just about having the right like market intelligence and insight to know who to talk to mm -hmm. and, and how to sell, but it's also having discipline because it's easy to get carried away and to lose focus uh, across all these stakeholders. And so focusing in, having that discipline to focus in on the right stakeholders, I think is, is critical and it'll ultimately maximize adoption and growth. Yeah, because, you know, a lot of people's, I guess, exposure or... Um you know, perception of the boardroom is what they see in movies and TV. And it's usually, you know, people screaming at each other, people getting ousted, you know, coups of those sorts. I know, you know, those are just the uh, very rare occurrences. You know, I guess my question for you is you've sat on a handful of boards at this point. What makes a good board ad advisor or observer? Like, what do you think someone who's maybe never been a board member and they want to be, or they're just getting their feet wet and they're serving on their first one and they're in their first year doing so, like what are some to do's and not to do's that you've learned over the years? Okay. So, so here, here's the obvious mindset. Go, go in just wanting to be helpful. Like, so that, mm -hmm. that's just having that, that, that I think obvious mindset is, is, is definitely to do. I think the second is understanding your role as an investor. I mean, the reality is the management team, I mean, if you pick the right one, they know their business better than anyone. You're, you're never going to know their business and their market better than they are uh, unless you yourself have operated in, in, that, in that type of company. Um, so understand that. But on the flip side, as an investor, you hold a unique position like kind of on the flip side where you have purview into all these different companies you're sitting on these different boards or you've invested in all in this wide variety of companies. And so as an investor, what you have is pattern recognition and that pattern recognition, you can, you can bestow upon the management team and help them kind of 
operate outside of the N of one that they're dealing with, because mm -hmm. it's just one company. It's an N of one experience, more or less. And so by giving them this, this kind of aggregated view of the market and being able to decipher, decipher from the pattern recognition what the success factors are. Um, like, for example, if you're trying to shorten the sales cycle for a given customer, they're targeting yeah. uh, like payers or, or health systems or whatever it is. By drawing upon the experiences you've had as, as an investor for those other companies, you can start to kind of uncover patterns of what are the common bottlenecks in this type of sales cycle? Yeah. What are the accelerators in these types of sales cycles? So you can you can give that pattern recognition to the to the to the management team. So that's that's one big like advisory role you can mm -hmm. uniquely play. And then the uh, the second uh, is connecting to customers and partners, yeah. just leveraging your, your network. Um, is something that can fill a gap oftentimes. And then the the third one, uh, I think this this I think this is often overlooked, especially for a successful company that has no problem getting capital, mm -hmm. is when you when you think about their financing needs for like six subsequent rounds that you're involved in, having having the discipline to kind of say no sometimes. Like, no, you don't need this much money mm -hmm. or this plan is you're biting off more than you can chew or don't take the highest valuation. Mm -hmm. um, and here's why, like th there are very good reasons why you shouldn't do some of these very tempting things, especially yeah. for a successful company. And I can walk through those, but I, I think being able to, to, and that gets to the general theme, I think of focus is yeah. as a, as a director or an observer on the board, like you can help the management team focus in ways that help them kind of see the trees from the forest. I love that. That's really, really helpful. I think my audience would love to hear how you evaluate founders and management teams in digital health. I think a lot of the investments you've made are on like maybe the earlier side of, you know, some of these companies. So kind of walk us through, you know, what makes a team great and, you know, how do you evaluate for those things on the front end? Yeah. I mean, there's no formula uh, per se, but I think some of the things we look for in terms of skill set. Um, and I'll get to the non-skill set stuff in a minute, mm -hmm. but you know, you're you're kind of looking for a, a a good comprehensive set of expertise across like the critical business units or disciplines. So commercialization expertise, product strategy, um, engineering technology, mm -hmm. uh, and then if, you know if it's a clinical product or like a care delivery platform, obviously clinical expertise. Yeah, and then just this general idea of just strong leadership. So those those are those are like the major categories of skill sets that you kind of want fleshed out. And of course, depending on the stage of the company, some will be stronger than others. Sometimes, mm -hmm. like when we get involved, there's almost never a sales force. You know, mm -hmm. the, the, like the sales organization is almost never mature. It's yeah. usually either the C, the founder CEO has been doing it the whole time, yeah. or he or she will have like a lieutenant who is kind of like the de facto head of sales. Yeah. Um, but but there's a difference between having an immature sales uh, organization and literally no idea how to sell the product to mm -hmm. begin with. Like not having that knowledge, I think is, is a, is a red flag actually. So, mm -hmm. so that's how I think about like, of course there's going to be gaps, but how are those gaps currently filled? That's kind of how we look at it. Um, and the CEO, you know, is obviously one we interface with the most, especially in the beginning. And that person will have strengths and weaknesses across the you know the menu of business disciplines yep. and i think i think the the acceptable kind of strength mix uh strength weakness mix of the ceo depends on the stage of the business mm -hmm. um and the team that that ceo surrounds themselves by you know when when you look at like an early stage product that's just getting going you know oftentimes it's pretty natural for that ceo to have a strong product strategy or engineering background mm -hmm. versus They've run large scaled mature businesses and, and sales and marketing functions thereof. Like that's not what we're expecting. But then mm -hmm. when our company re a Lira or an Omada static, you need to have a strong commercialization muscle. It's much different. Yeah. And then then I'll say, you know, regardless, and this is this is probably the most important and, and hardest to evaluate, but regardless of the business expertise mix of the team and CEO, um, there are all these soft qualities that, that you'd imagine that we really mm -hmm. care about. Uh, number one, a team that has a deep and even advantageous knowledge of the pain point. You know, they've mm -hmm. lived and breathed the problem that they're trying to solve. 
um, a team that's purpose driven. You know, they they're they're driven by the mission and they're resilient because of that. And yeah. uh, you know, they're motivated by by more than the payout. Yeah. Um, a team that's coachable and knows their blind spots and looks to people who can fill that for them, like investors or advisors, board members, et cetera, mm-hmm. um, or, or new team members. You know, maybe they, yeah. have a, they, have a, they have a gap in the team and they need to hire someone and then they know that and they're open to that. That's um, the pattern recognition I've found very, very um, make or break for a lot of companies is how open to advice is the uh, CEO and the business leaders. I think that is like probably the most common theme of every company I've ever worked with that have been really successful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, actually, that gets into, you know, what makes a great CEO, like someone who is who's willing to, like, give up the reins and delegate mm-hmm. and create that managerial leverage. Um, like, in many ways, kind of work yourself out of a job. Like, if you, if you, you know, God forbid, die tomorrow, like the company, the company still would needs- live. The company would live yeah. and you know, the things wouldn't come to a halt because you have these these business unit experts um, that, you know, and trust um, I trust. So speaking of trust, I'll, I'll end with this on like what mm-hmm. makes a good team and how we evaluate is ultimately a team, a team that you can trust. So that's that's why people say the management team, the leadership team is the most important. Yes, that's true. Um, but I'll tell you half of the reason why we spend so much time with the company uh, is, you know, one half is to like understand it and diligence the yeah. opportunity and get to know the ins and outs of it and really assess it from like an, like a technical investment standpoint. The other half is just kind of in the background of our heads, like how much do we trust these people? You yeah. know, like how, how comfortable do we feel entering into a partnership? How do we think they'll respond in these situations? So uh, and I'll, I'll end there. That's a, I'm That's going to dive lot. even a little deeper because it really interests me and I assume it would interest our audience. Um, how often are you just evaluating a company, hoping that like there's some adversity, there's some something with the business during that like betting period so that you can see how they respond to bad news or a challenging situation? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, so. There, there are actually two things. I actually hesitate saying this uh, because you we know, can edit it if you decide yeah. after the fact you're giving away a company secret or something. It's not so much a secret as like companies will know kind of what we're doing, which is which is this: like when we vet a company, we will be thoughtful in how how long we diligent something for for kind of what you said. There, there are two things that we wait for. One, yeah how a sales cycle will unfold. Like we'll introduce them to customers to be value additive, but to us, it's all, it's also selfish because oh, we want to see. Mutual benefit. It's yeah, yeah, we want to see how parties. it unfolds and see what the, oh, yeah. see in real time what it's like. Um, and adversity can naturally hit. The other, the other uh, part that we look for is um, honestly, if, if, we, if we can afford the time, buying some time to, to see if we can get more visibility into just their mm-hmm. near-term growth. Uh, prospects and see how good the management team are is at um, the, uh, defining their pipeline. Yeah. Because when you when you look at like as an investor dealing like we mostly deal with enterprise sales yeah. uh, most of the time they're not selling directly to patients and um, one of the key kind of tangible assets we can take from the company that helps inform our our view on just their near term growth is the pipeline like the sales pipeline yeah. and. Uh, Oh my gosh, it is easier said than done to evaluate those things because mm-hmm. the constructing a very tight kind of world class pipeline is very very hard yeah. and being able to evaluate it and normalize and calibrate your view like how real it actually is. Yeah. It takes time. It like literally just takes time more than oh, an hour. Like you just need to wait. So that's yeah. my response. <laughs> I'm a big believer in you don't know someone's character until they're down, until they've like come up against some adversity or they're not winning for yeah, a certain period respond. of time. And I think that's really telling. And that's when you know, like, okay, this is what a person really is. And this is who they are when they're under stress and they're under adversity. It's really easy to just look like everything's uh, normal and great when things are going well. But like when you start to have a couple struggles, I think a lot of warts can, you know, uncover themselves. Um, Agree. So I think Agree. it's an important part of due diligence. What made you join Providence Ventures? Like what was special about that one and what's kept you there? 
Yeah, I. Uh, what's kept me there? That's uh, ooh, a, a lot. This is a, this is a complicated question, actually. I think, you know, coming from, coming from like traditional firms, uh, strategy mm -hmm. grant, transformation capital. I saw firsthand, especially like with this explosion of digital health excitement in the market. I saw firsthand how hard it is to win deal. Finding the finding an attractive company is is half the battle, and it's mm -hmm. a big one. But then, like once you find it, how do you how do you convince them to take your money? It's it's mm -hmm. extremely hard because there's so much money out there, and people can talk about like the uncertainty in the the economy, which I guess has gone down now. But mm -hmm. e even like last year and during COVID, like all this uncertainty. But like what wasn't uncertain is how much capital is waiting to be deployed, and Correct. so so you have all this money, all this all this demand. But you don't have nearly as many attractive assets. There's like a supply demand mismatch, mm -hmm. and so whenever you do find a great company, it's all it's almost always very competitive, and you yeah. have to really show your your value as an investor. And oftentimes, what you're doing is like you're making promises, you know, all the connections you'll provide them in your network, and like leaning on one or two legacy partners that mm -hmm. everyone knows. And it it was hard it was hard to do that, you know, when I came across. The opportunity at Providence Ventures, it, it was the differentiation kind of sold itself. We we sit on a tangible strategic platform that has yielded hard results mm -hmm. over the past decade for for every single one of our twenty seven companies. And the value add PV brings said it's 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 not that hard to communicate. People know about it. People yeah. can see it. It's quick to articulate. And I think being a part of it personally uh, means and has meant I've been here for almost five years, it has meant that I have stakeholder connections to not just make a more informed investment decision, but also to more easily add value to companies in a unique way. Um, the conversation is just different as, yeah. as more than just a pure financial investor. And as far as what keeps me here is like, as you mm -hmm. think about future, we're not going away anytime soon. We're, we're kind of scaling what we, you know, when you think about our third fund, when we're on the doorstep of that, mm -hmm. we're replicating this strategy to other large health systems um and hopefully scaling what we do you know market wide if you look at our team, like half the team is new we've we've recently yeah. hired great people and so i feel like the future for us it um we're continuing all the good of our past and we are modifying things to get the best of both worlds going forward and i'm, I'm very excited for that yeah, it's a fantastic model. A uh, handful of weeks ago, we had Matt Herman on the podcast who you know, yes. was running Ascension Ventures for 20 years. So yeah, like the health system venture model has really, really gotten a hell of a lot more popular since you know they kind of began their right. journey 20 plus years ago. It's great to see. And you know, there's some really, really nice differentiators. Let's kind of peel back the onion a little bit. I think the value prop there is obvious. But when we're talking about a venture capital firm that doesn't have a health system or a health plan or a PBM or some big entity backing them and can make some pretty crucial introductions, let's just walk back to typical VC. You got some LPs, you got some big um, institutional investors, but there's no guarantee that they can get you into a specific buyer, a specific stakeholder. Other than having a network of people that you can make introductions to, what else do you think sets VCs apart and other things they can do that are value adds that can really allow them to maybe get you know, the investments they want at maybe a little bit more favorable terms than other groups? Like, What are the things that you've seen that make the biggest difference when you don't have an ace in the hole like you do at Providence? Um. I mean, I, I think uh, this this might be an underwhelming response, but when you think about just like a typical VC, if you want to if you want to stand apart and win deals at a good at a good price, I think it comes down to uh, two things. One is an actual history of doing what you say you can do for them. So yeah. being able to easily just point to your portfolio and say, hey. We've invested in 30, 40, 50 companies and like 70, 80 percent of them, they're all they're all working with big customers that we've done the work that we, we know these customers. We've introduced them to these customers yep. and they weren't just these these onesies, twosies introductions. 
Um, we've actually helped move the commercial needle needle for them. So just being able to point to that track record on on the value add side uh, goes a long way. And even going a step further, this kind of gets to interactions between VCs and co- and company. It's it's not a one way pitch. It's a it's a two way pitch. Yeah. It's a two way interview. It's a partnership. In addition to showcase your your value add track record, being able to point to CEOs that you've backed um, and say, call them, just call them, ask what we've done for them. And uh, there are two types of CEOs, ones that um, are still in your portfolio and ones that have exited. Talk Mm -hmm. to the ones that have exited um, uh, because they they can say whatever they want. They don't have your money anymore. They don't need your support. So it's they might want it again. So there might they, be some inside of to the sugarcoat things. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> the second one uh, is this. You might roll your eyes at this, but I've noticed it's it actually it does make a difference when you're trying to win the deal. You can be you can be the best you know VC in the world and have this big brand, but I think for a large percentage of entrepreneurs especially the ones that are, you know, middle-aged and above, they want to work with people they like. Yeah, they do. They just, I mean, they're, they're kind of done with the bullshit. And by being a normal person who they feel like they can trust, um, that they, they can be breathing just... down their neck in a couple of weeks. At their first there's quarter. not some emotionally unintelligent robot investor. Like there's mm-hmm. a lot of those in my industry. There's a big yeah. emotional intelligence issue that, that we deal with every day. And I, I'm constantly trying to check myself to not be a robot. And when you can, when you can, sh- when you can engender that mutual trust, like sometimes that alone will win the deal. Yeah. I like that. And I think like a cool, interesting idea would be don't necessarily only talk to the uh, CEOs that have exited their businesses. Cause that's like survivor's bias. Those are the CEOs that the investors probably spent the majority of their time with. They kind of picked them as their winners. They invested a lot of resources into those people. I'd even, if I were in like a founder's shoes, I'd want to ask other founders that maybe did okay, but they didn't have the 100x exit. And be like, hey, like, what did this investor do for you to help you? Even though you didn't get the huge windfall, you can retire tomorrow, you know, type of yeah. uh, outcome. That's, that's a good point. And I'm actually going to double click on that and and give you in the audience here another I'm divulging another little secret is you make these investments you're trying to invest in the best companies to drive the best returns but over time there be like a port- portfolio theory game going on mm-hmm. where some companies are dogs others are stars and ultimately you're going to prioritize your time on companies that are poised to constitute a larger proportion of your overall fund returns yeah, that's like that's what that's how you prioritize, and I, I that's that's not only fine, that's what you should do as an investor. Um, yeah. But to your point, like you still have a job to do, and you mm-hmm. still need to su- support companies that won't constitute a large proportion of your returns. And so, talking to those companies um, is smart, and I agree with you. Thank you. Um, what's the mission of Providence Ventures? Tell us about some of the incredible impact. PV has had on the digital health landscape. The mission, um, it's funny, we're actually, we're actually going through a, uh, a kind of a rebranding exercise right now as we get into fund three. So I've, I've thought about this a little bit and I'll, I'll tell you, um, talking about the mission of a like capitalist function is kind of mm-hmm. an iron, ironic thing. Yeah. Um, but I think like if I were to characterize our mission, like our, our mission is to do to do well by our, our, our companies and LPs by doing good. Like we're, mm. we're here to, we've picked healthcare for a reason. Like we're not investing yeah. in pure tech. Um, we're, we're here to transform healthcare by identifying and, and, and catalyzing the adoption of game, te- game changing technology by, you know, really, really leaning into your point about around like sh- shots on goal around customer relationships by really leaning into the stakeholder engagement that that mm-hmm. we have i mean like if if you look our small to- our small team of five investment professionals we've helped fund 27 companies to date and these companies kind of touch every corner of healthcare it's yeah. like with omada for instance i mentioned omada that's that's chronic disease management uh we have interoperability network optimization surgical navigation you know in several other categories mm-hmm. um and so the companies that we're investing in 
um, have had a large impact on patient lives ultimately. And that's kind of the mission here. Um, and all these companies, when, when you think about the work that we as a fund are doing, mm -hmm. all these companies work with customers or partners we've helped shepherd, you know, back to that kind of hit rate and that track record. Every single one of the companies we, we've, we've invested in, ha have, ha we can say that about, um, including Providence. Like they, they have all worked with Providence as well. Um, and that ultimately, you know, that, that, those, those connections and, and that kind of navigation support on the adoption cycle side. That, that's ultimately what what is, has catalyzed their adoption in the market, impacting more patients ultimately. I would imagine your five person investment team probably evaluates well over a thousand investment potentials a year, give or take. Is that about right? And it depends on what you define as like evaluate. We Let's definitely say hundreds at least. Oh no, we definitely see a thousand companies a year. Definitely, yeah. we end up talking to. Maybe half that, you know, five hundred a year, yep. and then you whittle it down, and we make four to five new investments a year, sometimes less. So that's know? a great example of like you got to show discipline and you got to scrutinize things and look at things very discerning because there's a lot of things you can get excited about, but it doesn't have like all of the bones to be successful. I guess my question is, and the reason I asked the question was, you've seen hundreds of pitches in the last year or two. Um, walk us through your advice to a early stage founder that's looking to go out for a raise, specifically like a seed or a series A. What advice would you give them? Yeah, I think um, actually this first comment I think is especially timely in like this, this gen AI generation. Yeah. Don't be a technology looking for a problem. Mm -hmm. Do it the other way around. Identify the problem, know it very, very well, kind of to my point earlier about the best leadership team, have an advantageous knowledge of the pain point, and then, and then build a solution around that. And that, that will include technology. It might also include traditional services and clinical stuff too. Like it doesn't really matter what the tech, technical modality is. What matters is what's the problem and how you're solving it. Um, and then second... I think demonstrating, and this is often overlooked, especially with companies like technology heavy, mm -hmm. like the Silicon Valley influence, is having a deep understanding of the user workflows and how mm -hmm. your product integrates into it. I guess it's just like an unfortunate reality of healthcare is like you could have a great product that, that actually, actually differentiated and poised to deliver value. But if there's another product out there that's maybe 70%, 60% as good as yours, It'll still win the customer if it means they're like, for example, integrated with Epic already and yeah. they're already compatible with user workflow. Um, so that's second. And then third, I'd say show that you can run a capital efficient business. Mm -hmm. Stop stop with these 30 to $50 million Series A rounds for unproven products mm -hmm. and have a clear path to profitability. Be realistic about valuation. And then back to my point around like, one half of our brain is technically evaluating the asset. Mm -hmm. The other half is like evaluating just the people. Um, so back to the second half of the brain. Remember when you pitch an investor, they're evaluating your ability to sell to, to customers, to partners, and ultimately to the ultimate acquirer. As a CEO, you're going to be the one doing yeah. the negotiating. Your second point really hit home on something. Again, a piece of pattern recognition take for what it's worth. But... I've noticed, you know, specifically founders that have a product and engineering bend to them, especially if they came from the tech world and then they come into the healthcare world, they believe best product wins. And you do have to have the threshold of, hey, you need a great product. It needs to work. Having said that, if you don't have the right commercial go-to-market strategy and you don't have the right team to execute that, it doesn't matter how good your product is. You need stakeholders that have influence to be able to push it and really commercialize and have a uh, full distribution strategy. And that's, unfortunately, I've noticed a bunch of entrepreneurs will really uh, give themselves a hard time by saying, we had the best product. It's way better than this company that's raised all this money and you know got billions of dollars of valuation. They might be right, but it doesn't change the outcome. They didn't execute commercially the other company did and that's where the valuation comes from is having customers not just having an amazing product by itself so i think that's another thing that if i ever 
changed my uh, day job and I fully went, you know, to an, an be an investor. I think that would be something I'd really highly index on is like, do they have a great product, but they, do they also know how it can mean something, but it doesn't mean everything. Yeah. And I, I actually to, to triple click on that, if I were to like articulate the list, like a very tangible list of, of things to look out for on that point, I call them like the last mile details of adoption. Yeah. So what's not last mile is like, yeah, great product. It's differentiated. Like it's there's the value prop is, is compelling and all this stuff. That's not last mile. The yeah. last mile stuff is like after you identify the right stakeholders, really understanding what what budget do they have? Like what where does the money come from? The budget levels. Do the do the, the does the stakeholder group that's receiving the value of the product, are they the same ones that are paying for it? Um, back to health systems, oftentimes you'll have a product that is paid for by one pocket of the health system, but then the other pocket of the health system is the one receiving the value. So like there's like this incentive mismatch and yeah. makes the option cycles longer. And then a third thing, so budget incentives, and then the third thing I'll mention is priority levels. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be a, a top priority. If you're yeah. not, you know, in the top 10, maybe 20 list of priorities, it'll, it'll be hard to get attention, even if you check all these, those other boxes. Yeah, the only way that can work is if it should be a top 10 priority, but they don't know a solution exists. Is That opens up another whole can of worms of like, are you the best product in an existing category or are you creating an entirely new category? Instead of being pulled by the market by a problem that people already know they have and they know what the solution looks like, educating them like you should have this. That's very hard to do as an investor to find the right products, especially in healthcare, because like the adoption cycles are so long. Like I'm personally scared to invest in those types of products. It's hard. I think it can work if there are other applications of that service or product just in a congruent market. If that makes sense. I'm, I'm going to leave the company name out, but there's a company I'm pretty involved with. I'm a big believer in what they're doing, but mm -hmm. what they sell does not exist. Having said that, there are other vendors that have a very similar model in different market categories. So let's say it's like chronic disease management. There's a similar model in COE bundled payment. There's a similar model in fertility. This is the same model, just applying it in an area that hasn't been solved yet. But, you know, I think if you can kind of like follow the, uh, you know, the wave, that another market category educated the market on and then apply it in a different way, that might work. But yeah, to completely well, yeah. change someone's mind is, you know, that's a tough thing. No, the, 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 the possibility is never, is never zero. It's just, it, it gets harder and harder. Basically, if you meet an idea before it's time, uh, but it's too far before it's time, mm -hmm. it's like there's, like there's a sweet spot, right? As an investor yeah. where you kind of time something where if it's too early, it'll never get adopted. Or if it does, it's too late. If you're too late, then like it's just overvalued. So like, how do you find the assets that are kind of in the middle? Yeah. That's, oh, that's okay. the job. What would you say the five most crucial traits a founder must have that makes them more likely to succeed than others? Uh, so some of this will overlap with, with, uh, the discussion we had around like evaluating a management team mm -hmm. and th this is partly my, my bias here, but, um, resilience, first of all, founders get not just like any, any management team, like they're, they're, they're going to get beat up um, yeah. a lot, um, from all angles. So resilience, coachability to your point, Norm, uh, work ethic, of course, L like a, a leadership team that actually has leadership skills and isn't just like an engineering team mm -hmm. that sits at the top. And then the fourth or the, uh, the fifth or sixth trait, I don't know. I don't know what the word is for this, but being able to pick the right people to yeah. like pick the right, assemble the right team. Um, and to attract the right team. You might be able to pick them, but if they're not saying sure. yes, yeah, yeah, it doesn't yeah. do a whole lot. Okay, to assemble. Let's use the word mm -hmm. assemble. It's both pick, picking in and we when can you agree on that. Yeah, so when you assemble a team, like it's the right team, it does two things. One is they'll fill gaps of expertise and knowledge yeah. of you as a CEO. But even if you're picking people who know how to do the same things as you, if they're organized correctly, you're, you're giving yourself managerial leverage. 
they're yeah. able to scale the organization. So like just this general idea of organization development and, and, and assembling the right team, whatever the word is for that. I love it. Yeah, no, I, I think a great example that uh, Glenn Tolman, you know, when I used to work with Volvango and we'd get a no, we'd ask ourselves, all right, is it worth us asking Glenn if he'll spend 30 minutes with this person? The several times we did that, the no's turned into yeses uh, just from that conversation. Because, you know, again, no one could sell the company better than him. And, you know, ultimately he was selling the vision of what Lavango is going to be. So I think, you know, that's a really, really crucial trait is to be able to get the people you want into the organization. Um, so I'm glad you said that. Um, walk us through, like, the most memorable or a couple of the most memorable pitches you've ever heard and why. Like, what made them so different? What made them so effective? See, it's a difficult question. Um, I think with okay, the, the disclaimer on this one is I'm not picking favorites by mentioning yeah. company company names. Um, but one of our portfolio companies, and I, th I think part of its recency bias, I was just talking about them, talking with them yesterday, but no two. You mm -hmm. mentioned them. So we, we're on their board. And no two is they're like the company trying to modernize how data is exchanged across healthcare, which is mm -hmm. like just a Herculean undertaking. It's it's ridiculous yeah. what what they've been up against and have overcome. Um, but they still have a long way to go, and it's a task that is so technically demanding that we have learned only a handful of people in the entire market are equipped to take it on. Mm -hmm. um, and No Two's leadership team, particularly the the CTO, are are those people. Like in our early conversations with them. What made them stand out was that it was clear from the start that they kind of checked all those boxes I mentioned. They are motivated by way more than the money. Like sometimes I wonder if they even know what, what it could be economically for them because they just have this undying fervor to this issue in healthcare of interoperability. Um, and, you know, I mentioned having an advantageous knowledge of the pain point. Um, I think they're like the most advantageous knowledge mm -hmm. of the pain point. They're like the entire industry looks to them for, for this. And then, you know, like true to their true to, to their professional form, they like they know their blind spot. Like, they know they're not untouchable. Like all of this could fall apart tomorrow if you don't make the right decisions and you're not careful. Um, and that knowledge and passion and mindset just it just really makes an impression on you. That's a really, really insightful thought. And it reminds me of literally a couple of days ago when I was watching the Masters. I was watching with my cousin and my uncle and my dad and a bunch of family. And Colin Morikawa goes to hit a putt on 18. And it was the difference between coming in third and coming in tied for eighth. Because like all the jumbled people. Mm -hmm. And someone in the group says like, oh, that putt just made him $400,000. That was not in his mind whatsoever. When you get to a certain level and like you're an elite athlete or elite at anything, you've put so much work and you've devoted your entire life to to doing something right you're not there because you're money motivated you're there because you want to be the best golfer in the world and he wanted to make that putt so that he could justify all the work he put in for probably the time he was five years old to then and it's just kind of funny how people think a little bit like it's always bigger than you know just the financial gain you know for a lot of people whether it's in sports professional life whatever it may be. Um, it's really, really insightful. What is a not so obvious or a couple not so obvious red flags that you look for in a founding team or in a company? Yeah, I, mean, I don't know how obvious or not obvious this is, but I think so put evaluation dimensions and criteria aside to just evaluate the deal. Yeah, It's one of the companies like it just raised a lot of money. It's raised too much money, especially relative to its stage. Even if the even if they're sitting on like favorable valuation, I think I know, like the data shows. The reality is that venture back companies that actually exit, you know, they they follow an exit distribution curve of yeah. exit values, and so um, and when you look at that and, and correlate it with the amount of capital that that they raise, the correlation isn't strong. Mm -hmm. So when a company's overcapitalized, it doesn't it doesn't mean they're going to have an even bigger exit. Like what it what it actually means, if you look at the data, is Oftentimes they're they're burning too much money, um, and or investor returns are just going to get compressed because the cost basis mm -hmm. is too high. 
I have a question. This will be controversial. Do you think that's a red flag because they took on more money than they needed and part of that was ego or part of that was, hey, I want to do it because someone else did it. How much of that factors in and how much of that is just two things that are completely separate? It, I mean, what you just said is another word for empire building, mm -hmm. right? Co not, not just companies do it, uh, entire governments do it, you know? Uh, so empire building is definitely takes a role. I think, I think another one is just, I think, getting enamored, not drunk with ego, but drunk with momentum. Like, oh, yeah. this worked out. Let's do this. Let's do this. Like, I don't, that, that doesn't have to be ego. It's, I just yeah. think it's, it's uh, you're playing a risky game at that point. It's not data driven. And then another is when in, when your investors push you to take on more money. That happens all the time, and yeah. the management team doesn't feel it's necessary. But they're like, no, 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 we have we have this this capital. You you know you don't need fifty million. You need fifteen, but take it. It's there at this valuation. It's a great valuation. So that pressure definitely takes place. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll stop there. Appreciate the honesty. Um, I always ask people who come on this podcast. You obviously live, breathe, and sleep healthcare. That's your business. That's your job. But how do you live it, breathe it, sleep it on the personal level? So how, in a very stressful job, do you find time to exercise and reduce stress? And what are the things you do to be able to do your job at the highest level? It's a good question. So, so here's some activities I do, but it, it's more than activities. And I'll get to that in a second. I, I work out a lot. I, I live in Salt Lake City. I moved here during COVID from Seattle. And... Every season, there's something to do. Like nature is demanding you be outside. It's awesome. I just broke my collarbone skiing. And Glad now it's you're on the mend. Yeah, I'm on the mend and summer is approaching. So now I'm going to go on my road bike and, you know, just. Mm -hmm. So I exercise is, is very, is critical. And I really enjoy doing it. Sleep is important too. But, but th those are like tangible things I do. I think what's, what's most important um, for this job or a highly demanding job where a lot, is, a lot is at stake. Like ultimately having this mindset of, of knowing what matters most. Yeah. What matters most to me, um, and I have to remind myself of this, is like my family yeah. and my health and, you know, the impact I'm having on people around me. Um, and because it's so easy to get caught up in this game. And like, yeah, there's a lot of money. Like people's lives are impacted by, by the decisions we make. Like no one's going to die if we make the wrong decision. If we decide not to participate in it, like that company will still get money from someone else. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's kind of silly sometimes how caught up I can get in this. And when I just take a step back and just realize, you know, my, my, you know, my little boy is never going to be four, four again. You know, my 11 year old, he's going to be in high school soon and he's not going to want to hang around me. Make, making, make, having the up, but statistics say that probably will happen for you. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm yeah. trying to really be conscious of that. So I think having that mindset and having your priorities straight, then like once you once you adopt that mindset and constantly work at it, then you're like you're in your job and you're, this isn't so bad. And you actually end up being more relaxed and you actually do better as a result. Very true. I think, you know, with living and breathing wellness, obviously like the physical activity and stress reduction is a big part, but also what you put in your body is really, really important. And one of the goals of this podcast is to inspire people to try new things, especially with their diet. So are there any really popular healthy recipes in your household that you'd recommend that maybe someone gets the inspiration to try themselves? And so my wife does this, this like two week cleanse yeah. and it's a cleanse that ironically, it has nothing to do with eating less, like having a bunch of these supplements or only eating vegetables. It's basically just focusing in on the things that really matter and just eat, actually eating a lot of it. So mm -hmm. it's like protein and grains and, and water, mm -hmm. and not really nothing else. But there's this one meal that actually tastes good, actually mm -hmm. hits all the right flavor notes without having all this sauce and sugar and all. You cook chicken with uh, peaches. Okay. Um, and onions and then the sauce that you use like this homemade um balsamic vinegar olive oil garlic combination it's an incredible meal no and there's no bad in it like there's no additives yeah. there's nothing and no calorie uh high sauces so i'll leave that with you 
All right. Well, when, when you find the recipe, send it over. Definitely would love to take a look. And again, Brandon, thank you so much for joining. Really enjoyed this. I think it gave some really interesting perspectives on what makes great investor, what makes great you know founding team. And again, thank you for joining us on the Digital Health Heavyweights podcast and uh, look forward to hearing more from Providence Ventures and you going forward. You got it. Thanks for having me, Norm. Thanks. Thank you for joining. Please like, comment, and subscribe below if you enjoyed it.